For centuries, Russia was ruled by czars. 17th century reformer czar Pyotr Alexievich Romanov, aka Peter the Great, expanded the czardom to a much larger empire and made Russia a major European power. He went undercover to learn shipbuilding from the Dutch United East India Company so he could build the first Russian fleet. In the 19th century, Tsar Alexander III had two fleets, the Baltic Sea Fleet and the Black Sea Fleet. But they were practically landlocked if they wanted to get into the Atlantic. But the Tsar didn't have a lot of options for a new fleet. Russia's Pacific coast was too remote and the seas in the Arctic Circle froze shut in the winter. But the Barents Sea off the Kola Peninsula never froze because of a warm Gulf Stream. And so the Tsar created the Fleet of the Northern Seas, with bases all over the Kola Peninsula. The Tsardom ended when, after the revolution of 1917, the Bolsheviks, led by Vladimir Lenin, killed the last Romanov Tsar and his family. Russia became a communist country when Yusuf Stalin centralized power and ditched the free market economy. The government now controlled everything. For instance, what food was produced where and who got it. Russia and a few neighboring communist states formed the Soviet Union. United, they could better fight the capitalist West who threatened their communist ideals. They did everything in their power to remain communist. They feared their own people might revolt against them, so they had the secret police force, monitor all Soviet citizens for rebellious opinions, revolutionary plots and treason. Those found guilty were sent to labor camps in Siberia or were executed without trial. Stalin got really paranoid when the super anti-communist Adolf Hitler came to power in Germany in the 1930s. The series of new purges ended the lives of millions of people. When Hitler invaded Russia during World War II, the Red Army fought several bloody battles and successfully pushed the Nazis out of Russia and beyond. They snatched up more territory for the Soviet Union along the way. The borders of these newly occupied countries were sealed off by a so-called Iron Curtain, making it virtually impossible for Soviet citizens to leave the USSR. Stalin feared a brain drain when all the scaled people would disappear to the West. The tensions between the communist Soviet Union and the capitalist West ran high. The two sides began an arms race, stockpiling weapons, most importantly, nuclear missiles. This period was known as the Cold War. Stalin renamed the Fleet of the Northern Seas the Northern Fleet. And at the height of the Cold War in the mid-1980s, 180 submarines operated from bases all over the Kola Peninsula. It was the largest concentration of naval power in the world. If necessary, the Soviet submarines with their ballistic and guided nuclear missiles could destroy enemy battle groups, convoys and western coastlines. They could also help land ground forces on enemy shores and defend their own coasts. Over time, the Cold War thawed and Prime Minister Mikhail Gorbachev reformed the government and granted the citizens more freedom. These reforms led to the revolutions of 1989, when people overthrew their communist government so they could leave the USSR. Soon after that, the Iron Curtain came down. Two years later, Boris Yeltsin won the first democratic presidential elections for the new Russian Federation. And he was like, out with the Soviet stuff, in with the free market economy. He held a fire sale of all state-run businesses to speed up the privatization process. But a small group of very wealthy business tycoons, aka the oligarchs, got their hands on it all and said thank you very much. This basically bankrupted Russia. Violent crime and corruption went up, fuel and food supplies went down, and money became scarce. Yeltsin reduced the military budget by 95%. The navy took a severe hit and the northern fleet collapsed. Bases, piers and torpedo loading cranes were no longer maintained. Northern Fleet naval officers threw everything overboard that wasn't considered vital. Reserve, support and search and rescue fleets pretty much disappeared. It wasn't enough. They couldn't afford to keep the large fleet. Only 40 submarines remained in active service. The rest of the subs were left to rotten harbors all over the coast, along with the fleet's many, many other decommissioned ships. Environmentalists were like, 
Remember the catastrophic nuclear power plant meltdown at Chernobyl in 1986? Well, those nuclear-powered submarines were floating Chernobyls. The Kola Peninsula got very poor very fast. Garrison towns ran low on supplies, fuel and spare parts. Sailor salaries weren't paid for months, forcing some to take on extra jobs. Some officers ended up hooking the bases up to the nuclear reactors on the submarines for power. Obviously, Yeltsin wasn't the most popular guy in Russian history, and people held massive protests. So, he did what any old-school Soviet leader would do. He changed the constitution and took over the government. In 1998, the Russian financial market panicked and the ruble collapsed because Yeltsin's government could no longer pay the bills. After a few bizarre public incidents, people also started doubting Yeltsin's sanity. They longed for a better president. In March of 1999, Russia was in a foul mood. NATO had dismissed the Federation as a cancelled superpower. They no longer involved them in talks about military conflicts brewing in their own region. When NATO countries interfered in a conflict in the former Soviet state Yugoslavia, Russia felt humiliated. They had to show NATO that they were still a force to be reckoned with, and the public wanted Russia to show support for the proud Serbian people. Prime Minister Vladimir Putin sent a submarine to the Mediterranean for the first time in 10 years, just to mess with the Americans a bit. The Northern Fleet picked the most deadly silent stalker to do the job, the Kursk. The K-141 was a six-year-old, billion-dollar Project 949A Antia-class nuclear-powered cruise missile submarine, or rather a nuclear-powered submarine cruiser with cruise missiles. The Antia was the largest class of cruise missile submarine ever built. Ironically, although Antius is one of Poseidon's sons, he only has strength when he is on land. If a submarine ever touched Mother Earth, it would be game over. The submarine was named after a region in Russia, Kursk, which was famous for the biggest tank battle in World War II. The Kursk submarine herself was also legendary. The nearly 15,000-ton Predator was two jumbo jets long, five stories high and 60 feet wide. The Kursk had 10 airtight compartments, twin nuclear reactors, twin propellers, a sauna, a swimming pool, a fish tank, a solarium, potted plants and a relaxation area with rocking chairs where the sailors could read or listen to music. She was basically unsinkable because of her double hull. The inner and outer hulls were separated by six and a half feet. This gap meant that the Kursk could survive a collision or a torpedo attack. Oscar II's, as NATO classified the Kursk, were designed to do one thing and one thing only. To hunt down and destroy American aircraft carriers and their battle groups. In the space between the hulls sat 24 forward-tilting launch tubes. They housed giant P-700 granite cruise missiles that could wreck aircraft carriers or wipe out entire cities when fitted with nuclear warheads. NATO called them shipwreck missiles. The Kursk had Sneak 100. She was coated in a thick layer of black rubber that prevented any noises inside the sub from bleeding out and absorbed sonar signals from enemy submarines or acoustic homing torpedoes. She was silent and virtually invisible. Kursk Captain Gennady Lichin and his crew headed out on a three-month mission to the Mediterranean to track, monitor and register as many NATO ships and submarines as they could. When she arrived in August 1999, the Kursk homed in on her primary target, the aircraft carrier USS Theodore Roosevelt of the American 6th Fleet near the Yugoslavian border. Despite the K-141 being super silent, the Roosevelt's crew knew something was up. They tried to track the Kursk, but the Predator kept disappearing. Eventually, the Americans were forced to send out P-3 Orion planes to find the pesky sub. P-3 Orion aircraft are submarine trackers that can drop sonar buoys to listen for sounds, register heat patterns, and even smell diesel fuel. According to Northern Fleet Command, this little unscheduled operation cost the US and NATO fleets tens of millions of dollars, burning thousands of tons of ship and aircraft fuel. 
Russia had achieved its goal and given the West a clear message. We're still here, losers. It is unlikely that the US and NATO forces use that much money on fighting the Kursk because despite the Cold War being over, Western forces still spied on the Russian fleet. They knew the Kursk was there. They had her acoustic fingerprint on file. But sure. On the last day of the year, President Boris Yeltsin announced his resignation on TV, and the Russians were like, yay! He named Prime Minister Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin as his acting successor, and the Russians were like, who? Putin was a mystery. People knew very little about him, apart from the fact that he was a former KGB colonel. He must have been really good at his job. So, who was he really? What were his plans for the country? Would he return to Soviet-style secrecy and deception, or would he want to strengthen ties to the West? A few months later, in March 2000, Putin was officially elected and the Russian Navy rejoiced. The son of a submariner, from St. Petersburg no less, was now in charge. They were back in business. Sure enough, a month later, Putin stood on the Northern Fleet Pier and announced a 10-year plan to seriously upgrade the Navy. The president-elect wanted to show the world that Russia still mattered on the military world stage. He declared that Russia's navy was the symbol of a strong Russian state and a pillar of its defense capabilities. He forgot to knock on wood when he said that. The Northern Fleet admirals were eager to impress the newly elected Russian president. In May 2000, they announced the Summer X, a three-day fleet-wide battle exercise in the Barents Sea. Summer war games had been around for a long time. Even in the mid-1990s, when there was barely any fuel, Northern Fleet Command managed to organize small-scale exercises. Northern Fleet Commander Admiral Vyacheslav Papov told his deputy, Chief of Staff Vice Admiral Mikhail Matsak, to organize the games in August in honor of Putin's 100th day in office, and to organize them on a scale not seen since the collapse of the Soviet Union a decade earlier. The Northern Fleet would send out a 36-ship armada to practice a Russian response to the invasion by Western forces. The West was thrilled! The Summer War Games were an excellent opportunity to gather intel. They planned to send out several spy vessels to the Barents Sea to listen in and register boats. They were mostly interested in the Russian SSBNs, nuclear ballistic missile subs, so-called boomers, and the SSGNs, nuclear guided missile subs, like the Kursk. Some of the Northern Fleet senior officers were not thrilled. The whole Summer X thing was a sham. Moscow may want to believe that the Navy was a pillar of the defense force. This particular pillar could barely even defend the coast. Only very few were aware that this summer exercise served as a cover for a secret mission. Admiral Popov wanted to see if they could sneak a submarine loaded with nuclear missiles past the American spy subs and slip under the Arctic ice without being tracked. NATO had wired the Barents Sea up the wazoo with hydrophones, radar stations, surveillance vessels, E-3 Orion submarine aircraft and live satellite feeds. And there was always at least one American spy sub in the Barents Sea, because the best way to track a submarine was still with another submarine. It was all part of an early warning system for the West, in case Russia wanted to be starting something. The average depth of the Barents Sea is 750 feet, just 250 feet deeper than the Kursk is long. There was little room for daring moves and a lot of room for mistakes. Just one navigational blunder could end in a collision or detection, each of which would create an international incident. As submarines became quieter, detection ranges became shorter and response times were significantly reduced. During the Cold War, there had been at least six collisions between Soviet and NATO subs. There were two accidents after, that we know of. In 1992, on the very edge of Russia's maritime border, the Kastrama was ascending to periscope depth. The captain had no idea that the USS Baton Rouge was directly above him. 
and the American captain had no idea there was a Russian sub below him. They were both only using passive sonar. It wasn't until the hull shuddered and metal screeched that the captains realized they were on top of each other. Both subs were damaged. The Pentagon tried to cover it up, but the Russians forced them to admit that the accident had happened. The Americans promised they would no longer hang out in the Barents Sea. They lied. A year later, the USS Grayling was tracking the Novomoskovsk and accidentally rammed the boomer's starboard bow. No lives were lost, no environmental or political drama unfolded, but oops. To monitor the games, the Americans had sent out the USNS Loyal Surface vessel to gather underwater voice and other electronic transmissions. The small NR-1 research sub was on a separate classified mission. But the sub's mechanical arms could retrieve any weapons accidentally left behind by the Russian war games so they could be analyzed. The USS Memphis, a Los Angeles-class nuclear-powered fast-attack submarine, was already out there to test some new acoustic equipment and a brand new navigational system. Her six-week mission had been extended by 14 days, because the USS Toledo, another Los Angeles-class boat, had been delayed. The Toledo would take over guard duty for the Memphis and was expected to arrive in three days. In the meantime, the Memphis would monitor the Summer War Games and keep an eye out for the K-141 in particular. The British had snuck the Royal Navy Swiftsure-class submarine HMS Splendid into the area. The home of the Kursk submarine was the Balshaya Lapatka Naval Facility at Zapatnaya Litsa. The home of the Kursk crew and their families was the garrison town Vijayeva on the Kola Peninsula. This secret, isolated outpost didn't officially exist, and no one could enter the base without documents and special passes. The town was named after Fyodor Vidyev, a poor trawler fisherman come fearless submarine captain, a World War II legend. The economic crisis had hit Vijeva hard. The decaying cinderblock apartment building suffered from power outages, heating problems, leaky plumbing and water shortages. The crews weren't paid regularly, if at all, so the community shared cars, apartments, food and tools. But all were proud to work on one of Russia's leading nuclear-powered submarines, the Kursk. On the evening of August 10, 2000, the Kursk was delayed getting out of the exercise area because of the slow torpedo loading process due to poorly maintained cranes and inexperienced crane operators. This was just an exercise, but the Kursk was in a state of constant readiness and authorized to carry a complete set of conventional combat weapons. In July, the Kursk had received two 6576A combat torpedoes the weapon was the length of an American school bus, weighed 9,000 pounds, and was exceptionally destructive. The sailors referred to her as the Talstuska, or Fat Girl, but the Navy called her the Whale. The Whale was problematic. Her operating systems were very complicated, for one, and she was a guided torpedo, not a homing torpedo, and could easily veer off course. And finally, the Whale's engine was powered by an extremely volatile oxidizer fuel system. It required a highly trained crew to check every step of her launch. For a torpedo to move underwater, it needs a powerful engine. An engine needs fuel, fuel needs to burn, burning requires oxygen, there is no oxygen underwater and that's where the oxidizers come in. The whale's oxidizer was high test peroxide or HTP. When HTP comes in contact with certain types of metal or even dust, it sets off a chemical reaction. The HTP expands really fast, releasing tons of heat. If that happened, the crew would have to get rid of her quickly, because the pressure inside the fuel container rises until it explodes. The weapon had a ton of safety features, of course, like an oxidizer control system to monitor her temperature. The Kursk had never had a whale on board before, and for good reason. The whales were long-range torpedoes, but the K-141 was a cruise missile submarine, and not a fast attack submarine. A torpedo attack requires the sub to make swift and sudden moves, and well, the Kursk sucked at that. If the Kursk was in a combat situation and fired this torpedo, the enemy would detect her right away and blow her straight out of the water. 
Therefore, having long-range torpedoes on board the K-141 was pointless. Underwater monsters like the Kursk carry torpedoes for self-defense. After launching a shipwreck missile at the enemy, anti-submarine forces would hunt her down. That's why she had anti-submarine torpedoes. Usually, the Kursk carried these, but the shelf life had expired and there was no money to replace them. Fleet Command needed to fill the torpedo tubes with something, anything. And so, the whales were loaded on the Kursk. It turned a cruise missile submarine into a universal multi-purpose one. The town was ablaze with gossip. Some crew members were saying there was death on board, but what the crew meant by that, no one knew. During the games, the Kursk would fire two practice torpedoes, a 6576PV and an USET-80. The 6576PV was the same as the 6576A, except she had no fuses and instead of a warhead she had water for ballast. Once fired, the water ejected and the whale floated to the surface. A special torpedo catcher boat would then lift the massive weapon from the sea they would analyze the data and reuse the weapon at a later date. This whale, though, had never been fired before. She was loaded on the Kursk on the 3rd of August, seven days before departure. The Kursk torpedo crew was new, and none of them were familiar with the whale's highly specialized systems. The warrant officer who commanded the torpedo compartment was seasoned and competent, but unfamiliar with the torpedo. The torpedo man trained for the whale exercise had been removed for insubordination. The lead torpedo man responsible for the whale had gotten injured and was hospitalized. His substitute was still on vacation, and the flag officer assigned to oversee the whale's shooting practice was ill. On August 10th, the Kursk received the second practice torpedo, the USET-80, with an electric propulsion system. A civilian came with it, an engineer of the Dagdiziel Torpedo Design Office. He was on a secret mission. He had to fit a new battery on the older electric power torpedo to improve its performance. Unlike the whale, the USET-80 did not require monitoring. At last, at 10.30 p.m., fully loaded, with the engines warmed, the tugboats in position, the course captain ordered Adet Svartovi to cast off all lines. Once they cleared the narrow fjords, Lichin gave the orders to dive, and the course headed straight for the exercise area. The Kursk arrived in her designated area five hours late. She went to periscope depth to report to Vice Admiral Alek Birtsev. Birtsev was aboard the fleet's flagship Pyotr Veliki. The Peter the Great was the Northern Fleet's only operational battle cruiser. The Kursk's first exercise was scheduled for noon. The crew would fire two shipwreck missiles at an abandoned vessel 200 miles away. At 12.40 p.m., the captain ordered the launch. The shipwreck missile wrecked the ship. Cheers all around. The second missile failed to eject correctly. Not super uncommon in Russia's navy, but everyone was satisfied. Early next morning, they would run a missile firing simulation. After that, they'd launch the whale and the USED-80. Meanwhile, at the Kremlin, Putin had been in and out of meetings all day. He was so ready to go on vacation. He would go to a villa in Sochi on the Black Sea. He was raring to go, but he had some more work to do. Only a few more meetings on Saturday and Putin would get on his flight to Sochi for a much-deserved break. On Saturday, August 12th, it was time for the exercise Defeat of the Enemy's AMG by the Fleet Strike Forces. AMG stands for Multi-Purpose Aircraft Carrier Group in Russian. The submarines weren't going to do any tactical maneuvers. There was no room for that. They'd only practice firing weapons. The fleet's forces were divided into Team South and Team North. The battlecruiser Peter the Great, the aircraft carrier Admiral Kuznetsov, the anti-submarine destroyer Admiral Chubanyenka, the guided missile destroyer Admiral Khalamov, and the missile cruiser Marshal Ustinov were Team South. Team North were the submarines. According to the practice torpedo shooting plan, Team North at between 4 o'clock in the morning and 6 o'clock in the evening even though it was considered really bad form, even shameful, for a crew to fail firing the torpedoes during their time slot, there would be no extensions. 
The Kursk was scheduled to fire practice torpedoes from 11.40 to 1.40. But first, the Kursk would simulate a firing of her entire cruise missile arsenal at Team South. At 6 o'clock in the morning, Captain Lichin radioed Admiral Yuri Bayarkin aboard the Peter the Great that he had arrived in the test area for the simulation. Bayarkin ordered him to descend immediately and head to the waiting area. Lichin ordered an emergency descent, and they began the simulation. Two hours of running through a bunch of commands and system protocols to prove they had skills. When they were done, the Kursk returned to periscope depth. Li Qin reported to Northern Fleet Headquarters at Severa Morsk that everything went smoothly, and he would now head to the 300-square-mile area for the next exercise, the torpedo launches. Once Team South invaded the zone, Li Qin could fire at his discretion, but within the scheduled two-hour period. Each submarine had strict orders to remain in the designated exercise area. If the surface vessels detected movements or sound outside this zone, they would know that those were Western spy subs. At 8.51 a.m., the Kursk arrived in her area, and Lichin contacted headquarters via shortwave. We are ready for torpedo firing. This message was relayed to the Peter the Great. The captain got the response. Dabro. Good. The Kursk would maintain radio silence until after the crew had concluded the test firing. The captain would contact the Peter the Great again no later than 1.40. Sometime between 9 and 10 o'clock in the morning, the torpedo crew received the captain's orders to load the test torpedoes. At 10.05 a.m., the Kursk sonar picked up the Peter the Great sonar signature. The captain began maneuvering the K-141 into an attack position to intercept the battlecruiser. Li Qin would launch the torpedoes from periscope depth. This was not something he'd do in wartime, when he had to remain undetected. But torpedo launches were complex, and this was much easier for his relatively untrained crew. They weren't practicing remaining unseen. They were practicing firing the weapons. The mock combat was about to begin. Li Qin gave the signal. Uchivnaya trivoga, tarpinea ataka. Practice alarm, torpedo attack. Once the surface ships entered into the Kursk's firing range, Lichin would raise the periscope and the antennas and use radar as well. This made it easier for a test torpedo to get an accurate lock on the target. At 11.20 a.m., the sonar operator on the Kursk reported being pinged by the Peter the Great's massive sonar sweep. The Kursk pinged back. Now the hunter and the hunted knew each other's positions. Again, in wartime, neither party would use active sonar or radar, but Russian fleet commanders always used them during firing practice. The Kursk commander ordered the torpedo crew to prepare to fire the first practice torpedo. The crew started flooding torpedo tube number 4 lower bank port side with water. Inside this launch tube was the whale. At 11.28 a.m., torpedo tube number 4 was filled with water, the back cover was bolted shut, and they were ready to launch. During their entire northern run, the USS Memphis crew had been in condition 2, modified general quarters, the second highest state of alertness. The only state higher was general quarters, aka battle stations. For the last 48 hours, the sensors had been picking up and recording the sounds of several Russian missile launches and torpedo firings. They had fingerprinted and identified four separate Russian submarines by their radio traffic. The Delta III-class boomer, the Barizagilevsk, the Delta IV-class boomer, the Karelia, the attack submarine of the Victor III-class, the Daniel Moskovsky, and finally the anti-class, the Kursk, located about 20 miles southeast of their location. But the Russians had about a dozen subs out there. The Americans had, for instance, failed to spot Victor III-class attack submarine the Obninsk and the super-quiet Akula I-class Lyapart, which was 15 miles away from the Kursk, escorting the Karelia. To be fair, no one in the Russian fleet had spotted any foreign submarines, or perhaps that's what they like us to believe. Either way, they knew the spies were out there, somewhere. Late that Saturday morning, the Memphis specialist eavesdropped on the final exercise of the day. 
the Russian submarines were ready to launch their practice torpedoes. At 11 hours, 28 minutes and 26 seconds, the sensors aboard the Memphis went wild and a powerful shockwave shook the hull. Even those without headphones could hear it. What the hell was that? Was that a torpedo shot? If it was, they'd never heard anything like it before. Captain Breer made a quick assessment. Was the Memphis in immediate danger? Had her covert mission been compromised? He couldn't radio his fleet commanders to tell them what was happening. Any radio contact would reveal their location to the Russians and they weren't supposed to be there. Not unless there was a clear threat to national security or if the Memphis was under attack, could the captain break radio silence. Breer knew plenty of the other detection systems would have picked up the noise and they could call people. Sure enough, the USNS Loyal Sonar Array, the SOS's hydrophones, the Norwegian P-3 Orion aircraft with their strategically dropped sonar buoys and the coastal seismometers of RSS and NORSAR all detected something. But NATO observers had no idea what the readouts and the noise meant. Sweet Peter on a popsicle stick. Two minutes and 15 seconds after the blast, another explosion, 250 times larger than the first. The explosion showed up on seismographs thousands of miles away in Alaska and Africa. Norsar registered a tremor measuring 3.5 on the Richter scale, but there was no one around to notice. Everyone was away for the weekend. Captain Breer was curious to find out what was happening, but he ordered the USS Memphis to get the heck out of Dodge. That horrific noise sounded like the explosion of a submarine. And if that was the case, it meant pretty much the entire Northern Fleet was about to head for their location and that Memphis had to remain unseen. NATO observers checking the data knew this was some major catastrophic event. Was that a submarine going down? But the Northern Fleet continued the summer war games as if nothing out of the ordinary had happened. Had this just been part of the exercise then? Highly unlikely. People started making calls. None of the dozen or so Russian nuclear submarines appeared to have recorded these explosions as anything other than just that. Explosions. They've been blowing up stuff for two days. The boomer, the Karelia, was rocked. Captain Andriy Karobliev thought he had hit another sub and ordered damage reports from all compartments. No leaks or other damage were detected. Karobliev asked Rear Admiral Shegiliev for a second opinion. Shegiliev was command writing, monitoring the performance of the senior officers during the exercises. They concluded it had probably been a weapons detonation or a depth charge. Karobliev had only received orders concerning his specific task. He had no idea what the orders of the other warships were. He could send in a report, but he would commit a mortal sin. He would reveal the Karelia's location to the Western spy vessels who were most definitely lurking nearby. If it was a weapons test, it was none of his business. If it was an accident, well, the Karelia was a nuclear submarine, not a Coast Guard vessel. Karobliev didn't report the blast and prepared for his crew's own torpedo firing. The Lyapart was only 15 miles away from the Kursk, escorting the Karelia, but her mission was secret and few knew she was even involved. The captain didn't report anything out of the ordinary. On the surface, 29 miles away, the Peter the Great trembled. Officers on the bridge felt it. The battlecruiser sonar man saw a dramatic flicker on the screen on a bearing dead ahead. He reported a powerful underwater explosion to the Northern Fleet admirals gathered on the bridge. The sonar man didn't have a good fix on the blast location and waited for the order to home in. He received no such order. Papov, Bayarkin, Birsev and the others acknowledged the report but put it to one side. Explosions happened in exercises. There had probably been a misfire. No one wanted to probe it further. Not that there was anyone on board who could actually analyze the data anyway. All the chiefs and their subordinates kept watching the water, looking for torpedo jet streams on the surface to track their trajectories. The Peter the Great entered the K141 exercise area to get into the firing range of the Kursk, but the Kursk wasn't firing torpedoes at them. Curious. 
Because the Russian fleet didn't react to the explosions at all and the radio chatter didn't increase, the Western analyst couldn't figure out what had happened. Clearly, if there'd been an accident, the Russians would respond, right? At 12.30 p.m. aboard the Peter the Great, Admiral Popov told a government television crew that the whole operation was nearly finished and it had been a great success. The taped interview would air the next evening, on Sunday. The weather was getting bad. Still, Popov took a helicopter to the nearby aircraft carrier Admiral Kuznetsov. When a storm broke loose and it started to rain, Popov couldn't return to the Peter the Great. So, the man in charge of the Summer War Games headed back to Northern Fleet headquarters in Severomorsk. Because that made sense in the middle of an exercise. It was 1.40 p.m. The scheduled time for the Kurs to complete her torpedo firing came and went. She had not fired any torpedoes. Once a submarine completed the training and was clear of surface ships, the captain had to surface within the hour to report the results of the shooting to the commander in charge of the exercise. A submarine could surface earlier in case of a failed firing, as long as she was at safe distance from the surface ships. But there was no sight of the Kursk. No torpedo launch, no signal, no alarm, no SOS. According to Navy rules, submarines had to surface at a specified time and check in to let everyone know she was fine. If a sub didn't surface within one hour after the designated time of ascent, she was assumed crashed. Then the fleet commander had to trigger a fleet-wide alarm and send out searcher planes. The command vessel would have to remain in the area. Those are the rules. It was costly to launch a rescue operation, though, and it wouldn't be the first time a submarine commander simply forgot to report in and an alarm went out for nothing. At 2.15 p.m., Team South left the exercise area. The Peter the Great stayed on the edge of the designated area, waiting for the Kursk to surface and report the failed exercise. The rest of Team South headed for the other exercise area without the cruiser. But no ship was allowed to do combat exercises without the combat director being present. He was still on the Peter the Great. But on schedule and without incident, the Karelia, the Barizaglievsk and the Daniel Moskovsky launched their weapons successfully. The torpedo catchers tracked and grabbed all the torpedoes as they floated up to the surface, retrieving them for future use. But no torpedoes of the Kursk were found, and the sub didn't surface to report why not. Commanders Biritsev and Bayarkin started to get worried. They ordered a check for Kursk's radio transmissions anywhere in the fleet. The Kursk might have a communication issue. This was not uncommon. The equipment at this time was not exactly reliable. But in that case, the sub would be on the surface. The Admiral sent out a helicopter to look for the Kursk. The pilot saw no subs and no emergency buoys that would have deployed in case of an accident. The emergency buoy was linked to sensors that detected a range of emergency conditions on board a submarine, such as increased pressure inside, flooding or fire. Any emergency would automatically trigger the buoy's release, sending it shooting upwards on a cable. When it reached the surface, an antenna would transmit distress signals. Once the buoy was located, rescuers only needed to follow the cable down to the sea floor to find the missing submarine. At 2.40 p.m., the Kursk had not surfaced. At 2.41, according to Navy rules, fleet leaders were required to announce the fleet-wide emergency alarm to let everyone know the Kursk had had an accident. They didn't raise the alarm. Instead, the Peter the Great transmitted an emergency ascent signal to the Kursk. Apparently, the admirals believed that the Kursk was continuing to carry out the combat training mission, even though their exercise had a strict start and end time with no extensions. Navy rules dictated that once the submarine commander received an emergency ascent signal, he had to stop whatever he was doing and surface. He had one hour to comply. If, within one hour after the signal, the submarine had not surfaced, she was definitely crashed. Maybe. 
One hour later, the Kursk had not complied with the emergency ascent signal. She had not surfaced. This was the second instance that Fleet Command should have raised the alarm. They didn't. Meanwhile, in Moscow, Putin was so ready to go on his vacation, but he was still in a meeting at the Kremlin, trying to figure out how to handle the response to the recent apartment bombing in Moscow. He had no idea trouble was brewing in the Barents Sea. Admiral Popov in his Severomorsk office was weighing all the consequences of sounding the alarm. The moment the Russian ships began working in a search pattern, the spies in the area would know they had an emergency, then Popov would have no choice but to notify key military and government officials. Delivering bad news to superiors had no benefits. In fact, the mere act of delivering bad news could lose Popov his job, and the Admiral had taken a calculated risk organizing the Summer X Games. He knew his rescue fleet wasn't in the best shape, and he was ultimately responsible if anything happened. If the Kursk was down, someone would be blamed and it would be him. If lives were lost as well and people had to be buried, he would be buried first. And if after the spies and the top officials, the press found out about this alarm, this whole thing would turn into a three-ring circus. In the old days, in the Soviet Union, this situation would have been very easy to contain. Submarine disasters were simply not reported beyond a need-to-know group. There were no investigations, no public hearings, the media never found out, and leaked stories were flatly denied. Families were told nothing besides that their loved ones had been lost in action. In the Soviet Union, every citizen had been a ward of the state and owed allegiance and their lives to the Union. But Russia today was different. The free and independent press would have a field day with this and whip everyone up in a frenzy. And if the Kursk was not in trouble, but playing tricks on them, perhaps because of a secret directive, they'd all have egg on their faces. Better safe than sorry about his own career, Popov didn't raise the alarm. If the Kursk really was in trouble, she would send an SOS and an emergency buoy would appear. Popov would get worried at 6, at the Kursk's next scheduled check-in time. At 4.30 p.m., the fleet commanders lost patience. Admiral Bayarkin ordered the transmission of a message on the underwater telephone system. Vitnik, report your coordinates and operations. It set off a flood of messages, both voice and typed, to contact the Kursk with her exercise call name, Vitnik. All remained eerily quiet. Admiral Popov now ordered a helicopter to be put on standby so he could return to the Peter the Great the moment the weather allowed it. They were gonna have to start a search and rescue mission, but Popov compromised. They were gonna do this very quietly. Two Aleutian IL-38 submarine search craft were sent out to look for any signs of the Kursk on the surface of the Barents Sea. Oil spills, debris, anything to indicate an accident. With her emergency systems, sophisticated communications and rescue marker buoy, the course couldn't just go missing. Captain Breer was preparing to order the withdrawal of the USS Memphis from the Barren Sea to make way for the USS Toledo. Then the radio crew told him Russian radio traffic to and from the exercise area went nuts. Something was going on. And it was serious. Five hours after the explosions, the United States was waking up. Defense Secretary's Chief of Staff Robert Tyre was on a golf course when he received an urgent call from the Pentagon. It appeared a Russian nuclear submarine was down in the Barents Sea. Tyre called Defense Secretary William Cohen, but he issued no orders. Six hours after the blast, National Security Council Secretary Mark Medish was on a tennis court when he received a call from the White House Situation Room. They were following reports of a massive underwater explosion in the Barents, possibly involving a Russian nuclear submarine. Medish called National Security Advisor Samuel Sandy Berger about the possible accident. Berger was in Los Angeles with President Clinton at the National Democratic Convention. He decided not to wake the president until the situation was more clear. But you just wait and see. 
the Americans were gonna get blamed for whatever had happened. But if the Russians needed help, the United States would do what it could. The Clinton administration had worked hard to help Russia transition from the Cold War era into the new democratic era. Yeltsin had clearly been anti-Soviet, but no one knew Putin well enough to know what he would do. It was too early into his presidency to tell. So far, he'd been pretty evasive about agreeing to any propositions from the US. The staff started to refer to Putin as Mr. Nyet. Most US senior officials were on vacation, but the news about a possible downed sub quickly spread through the ranks. By noon, everyone in the American security and diplomatic system was in the loop. Everyone but the diplomats at the American embassy in Moscow, that is. No one got them up to speed on what was happening in the Barents Sea. And no one at the Pentagon told the folks of the American sub-rescue system at Camp Pendleton in San Diego to stand by either. The British Ministry of Defense had received reports that something was happening in the Barents Sea, but they told no one. Not anyone at their embassy in Moscow, nor did they order their own ultra-high-tech submarine rescue force to stand by. Had a European submarine been in trouble, it would have been a different story. There would have been a worldwide all-points alarm and everyone would have jumped into action right away. But this was a Russian sub, and a very creepy one at that. At 5 p.m., Popov's deputy, Admiral Matsak, quietly alerted the Northern Fleet's rescue forces. The Northern Fleet's rescue chief, Captain Alexander Tieslienka, had one halfway decent rescue ship. She was a 20-year-old former lumber carrier, Mikhail Ratnetsky, which had been converted to support submersible rescue operations. The Ratnetsky carried two deep submergence rescue vehicles, the AS-32 and the AS-34 Priest class. Northern Fleet rescue vessels were always at a four-hour standby. Except when a submarine went out to sea. Then all fleet rescue vessels were put on a one-hour standby for the entire time the sub was away. Meaning that once they got the call, they would be ready to leave within one hour. There were about a dozen submarines out there. For some reason, the Ratnetsky, the only rescue vessel available for a submarine rescue operation, was docked in Severomorsk, some 11 hours away from the exercise area, and she was still at a regular four-hour standby. Tieslienka called the Ratnetsky commanding officer Yuri Koistin at his home in Severomorsk. He told Koistin to be ready to leave in one hour, but he didn't tell him why. The rescue crews were picked up from their homes to go to the docks. Pretty much all of them thought it was an exercise. There was a search and rescue drill planned for Tuesday, two days from now. But maybe they moved the exercise forward. Or perhaps they wanted to see how quickly the crew could get to the pier in case of a real emergency. Either way, they figured they'd be home again in a few hours. Once they got to the pier, they started hearing the rumors. A submarine was in trouble, but no one could say which one. At 6.30 p.m., Tieslienka ordered the Alte tugboat to prepare for a search and rescue mission. The Alte could support divers, tow grounded ships to deeper water, rescue people in the sea and work above sunken vessels. On the Peter the Great, Bayarkin, Birtsev and other senior fleet commanders handed a few sailors binoculars and told them to look for any evidence of a ship in distress. A buoy, an oil slick, even blown debris that submariners were trained to eject if their rescue buoy failed to deploy. Six and a half hours after the blast, the Kursk failed to make her six o'clock communication check. Now, Popov was officially worried. That was it. No more games. They had to find the Kursk. Admiral Popov ordered more vessels to the scene, but he had not yet formally declared a fleet-wide alarm, and he had not alerted his superiors. Instead, he ordered Bayarkin to head up the search efforts from the Peter the Great until he could get out there himself. Putin had wrapped up his affairs at the Kremlin and headed for the airport to go to Sochi and start his vacation.
Meanwhile, in the United States, Medish arrived in the Situation Room at the West Wing of the White House, still dressed in his tennis clothes. This is what the Americans knew. There had been abnormally big explosions in the Barren Sea during the Russian Summer War Games. They'd intercepted a bunch of radio transmissions, most of them unencrypted. The messages suggested that there was some kind of an emergency. It looked like a Russian search and rescue effort was getting underway. Main assumption was that a nuclear submarine was down. The prospects of survivors were unclear. U.S. submarines in the area were monitoring the situation. Medish talked to people at the Pentagon and the State Department. Shouldn't the states offer the Russians help? Well, if Soviet Russian history was anything to go by, senior fleet officials on the scene were probably misleading their superiors already, both military and civilian. And Putin had just departed the Kremlin to get on his flight to Sochi. This meant that either the Russians didn't understand the scope of the crisis, or that the leadership was kept blissfully unaware or both. They couldn't just call people to ask if they needed help. If Russian officials didn't know what had happened and the Americans told them about it, then the Russians would know that the Americans had been spying on them. It would compromise US intelligence gathering methods. It might also be insulting to offer the Russians help. They might just want to deal with it on their own. Plus. The Russians would be very suspicious of any U.S. offer for assistance. Americans would just use the operation as a cover for a spy mission on their top-secret vessel. Sure, they would help, but the Russians had to ask for it. But if they did request help, well, then good luck trying to get any technical data they need to connect Western rescue submersibles to one of their own hatches. Still, Berger decided to discreetly contact his Russian counterpart, the Russian Security Council chief Sergei Ivanov, to get the 411. He was stunned to find out that Ivanov was headed for Sochi with Putin and wouldn't be able to talk to him until Monday at the earliest. Now that was weird. Since Americans rarely called unannounced during the week and they never called during the weekend, didn't Ivanov realize this was an emergency? They had to know about the enormous explosions that happened seven hours ago. But Ivanov didn't know, Putin didn't know, the American embassy didn't know, the British embassy didn't know, no one in Moscow knew anything about what was happening in the Barren Sea. At 7.30 p.m., Putin's jet had taken off from Moscow airport and was headed for Sochi for the president's vacation. At the same time, Popov ordered the vessels in the Kursk-designated area to call in reports. Had they heard anything? The commander of the Lyapard submarine, which had been closest to the Kursk, said that they hadn't noticed anything strange. But he couldn't locate the K-141 either. Popov ordered Bayarkin to drop a bunch of grenades into the water to try to hail the Kursk that way. They launched the first salvo at 8.30 p.m. No response. 15 minutes later, the second. Nothing. 20 minutes later, the third. Nada. And then, 40 minutes after that, the final series of grenades exploded in the Barren Sea. Still, not a single response from the Kursk. Then again, no ship was close enough to be able to hear any responses from the Kursk, if, say, anyone was tapping on the hull. 10 p.m. It was getting dark. The IL-38s were ordered to return to base. They had found nothing. Admiral Popov wasn't sure what to do next. Neither the aircraft nor Bayarkin had anything new to report. The Ratnyetsky was still docked, not ready to leave yet. The Admiral decided on a dangerous move. The Peter the Great should go directly into the Kursk area and try to signal the sub to the surface. It was a risk, because if the Kursk suddenly surfaced underneath the cruiser... At 10.30 p.m., the Northern Fleet declared an emergency and stopped the Summer War Games. In the meantime, the Karelia had docked. When Captain Karobliev heard about the missing Kursk, he put two and two together. He told his superiors that his sub had been shaken by an unusual underwater explosion at about 11.30 that morning. Karobliev hadn't reported it, because he thought it had been part of the exercise. 
He was told to immediately provide data on his course, speed and depth at the time, and any possible estimate for direction and range of the source of the detonation. Admiral Bayarkin immediately directed the Peter the Great to where the Karelia had recorded the explosion. Lacking good data, the cruiser began zigzagging along the alleged bearing, echoing the seafloor to find anything sticking out. 11 p.m. The submarine's final scheduled time for communication came and went. No one had communicated with the Kursk for 14 hours, and all remained quiet. Admiral Bayarkin and other senior fleet officers now decided to broadcast the Karelia's data over the fleet's open communications channel. At 11.30, at a bearing of 096 from location 69 degrees 40 minutes north and 36 degrees 24 minutes east, an impact blow was heard. At 11.30 p.m., Admiral Popov kissed his career and the careers of his fellow commanding officers goodbye and ordered the Buvaya Trivoga the combat alert. The alert was broadcasted fleet-wide and to all naval facilities across the Kola Peninsula, including Vijayeva. The submarine Kursk, tactical number K141, commanded by Captain First Rank Lichin, is missing. A search and rescue operation is being launched. 22 Northern Fleet vessels carrying 3,000 sailors all made their way over to the designated exercise area to help find the Kursk. Admiral Popov called his boss in Moscow, Russian Navy Commander-in-Chief Admiral Vladimir Kuryedov, and told him that they had lost contact with a nuclear-powered submarine in the Barents Sea. The Kursk was officially declared to be in distress.